Hello and welcome to the to Hull and Back podcast, sponsored by Six Yards Out and Pearson's Bar in Hull. Now you can see I'm joined by a very special guest this evening. He racked up 191 appearances for City, scoring 19 goals, and he took the club to new heights, not just back to the Premier League, but the FA Cup final and, of course, European football as well. It's none other than former Hull City midfielder David Myler. There's a big intro for you, mate. How are you keeping? <laughs> I'm good, thanks, Matt. How are you, pal? Yeah, I'm very well, mate. I'm very well. Great to have you with us on the show. Um, we're going to be discussing a lot about your City career, um, the, the highs, the lows, uh, and the current City squad as well, and what you're up to in your own career as well. Um, so I guess let's just, just get started, shall we? Um, and we'll start with you actually joining Hull City. Um, talk us through that process. I know Steve Bruce was in charge at the time. Was he, was he a big influence for you joining? Well, Steve Bruce is the main reason why I joined. Um, I had him as manager at, at Sunderland. Um, I played games for him. Obviously, then Steve lost his job. Um, in between that and Martin O'Neill taking over, I had two cruciate ligament injuries. And basically, Brucey was in charge of um, Hull. And I was looking for regular game time. I was trying to get back in the team at Sunderland. I was trying to play. And he basically got in touch with me. He says, look, you're not playing. Um, I've got a fantastic group here. I remember him saying, we've got a, this nice little training ground. Great bunch of lads. And he said, um, I think we're going to get promoted and I want you to be part of it. So I initially came on loan, I think it was two months, joined uh, for November and December. I think it was like 12 games. Um, and then I ended up signing permanently in January. I was just, uh, it was one of the best decisions I ever made going because we were just, like I imagine we'll, we'll, we'll dig a little deeper into it all later on. But like we ended up being so successful, that group of players. It's arguably the most successful team that ever played for Hull. Um, just so, yeah. like, obviously, you'd have the older generation might debate different teams. No problem with that. But to be a part of something special and the success we had is, you know, it's 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 all you ever dream of when you when you become a footballer is being successful. Absolutely, you, you achieve so much. And as you say, we'll we'll get onto that uh, later on. Uh, I want to talk about that season. I remember the game against Leeds. I think over Christmas, where you scored yeah. a header. The second goal, I remember that I was right behind it in the south stand, uh, cheering away. Um, that season will be known for plenty of things, but one that it will be um, significantly remembered for is that final game of the season. Um, just, I want to get your take on on the entire game itself, um, and and of course the the weight as well. It was excruciating for for us as fans. What was it like for you on the day as a player? Like obviously. We played Bristol. I think it was Bristol at home just before Cardiff. And we had, if we'd won, we would have been promoted. I remember I had a chance in the last minute and the keeper made a great save. So we were kind of going into the Cardiff game. They'd already been promoted as champions. We knew it was going to be a tough game. We knew that they had been celebrating, obviously, since they'd been promoted. But like Malky, or um, what's his name? Malcolm McCoy. He was Malky manager. McCoy, yeah. um, Malky McCoy, yeah. That's the one. Um, he had been manager, but he had links to Watford. And supposedly, mm. he had Cardiff gunning to beat us so that Watford could get promoted as well. Then he'd um, go. Well, I don't know. Would he go? Um, but, but like that whole week, like training was so intense because we kind of knew what we were doing. At the same time, you never knew what kind of team Cardiff were going to play because it could be an opportunity to give fellas games. Like, you know, contracts were up in the air for some players. You didn't know what was like kind of happening. But then, like, once the game kind of kicked off, I, I've never watched, like, the game back. I've obviously watched the dramatic, whatever, 14, 15 minutes it is. Because that there is a good clip on YouTube of it, and it's, it's, it's quite surreal to watch. But, like, the first half is dull and boring. Like, it's two teams on edge. Obviously, hmm. with the Cardiff fans in the, in the ground, the Hull fans, there's chanting and cheering for, like, obviously Watford are playing Leeds. Oh, Watford are one and up, Leeds are one and up. We don't know what's going on. You just kind of hear echoes in the crowd anytime there's a pause in play. Start to the second half, they score straight away. Um, and obviously we pull two back. And like, it's just that moment of when you get to, like they're piling on the pressure, trying to equalize. I remember big day Stockdale and goal, catch the ball. I make this like 50, 60 yard sprint up the pitch. He boots it long. I end up getting full for the penalty. The whole fans think that the referee's blown for full time. They come on the pitch yeah. and we're like, get off the pitch because like we know it's not full time. We're like, get off the pitch. So now there's obviously this big delay. I wanted to take the penalty 
Um, mm. Steve Bruce wanted Nick Prosvich to take the penalty. Now, Nick had already scored in the game, but he wanted him to take the penalty. Now, his record going into that was like 16 penalties taken, 16 scored. Yeah. He obviously misses. Like, they then go down the other end. Abdullah, big Abby puts his hand out and handballs the ball. Penalty them. Nicky Maynard scores. It's like two all. And we're just like, oh, my God, we could have been three, one up to now two all. And like, we initially straight away, obviously, we didn't really know what was going on in the game. It was only kind of when we got in the tunnel, we got like, people, you get a trust, a trusted source. Because obviously, yeah. there's different things going off. You don't know what's actually happening. So we find out that, I think at that time, it was Leeds were one nil up. Um, if I remember correctly, but what yep. like hit the post, hit the bar, there was all sorts going on. Um, and then we're all kind of like, oh my god, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And then we're like, you're you're almost thinking, well, if they score, what happens? Because we've we've technically drawn, and then they get drawn, so we'd have been okay. But then we're thinking, well, if they win, and I imagine those like there would have been messages gone to the Watford players, like from the bench to say like, well, if you win, you're promoted. Like they've drawn. But like when Ross McCormick chips the young goalie, it's just like, oh my God. That was the moment we realized we'd been promoted because you're like, it's virtually impossible for them to score three goals in two minutes. Um, and then it was just it was just carnage because even like Abdullah Fade giving away the penalty. So we were kind of like scattered between the corridor, the players changing room, the managers changing room, or the coaches, staff changing room. We were kind of scattered everywhere, kind of like realizing what was going on. Like Abdullah was in the toilet crying because he thought he'd cost the entire group promotion and then wow. obviously even when the final whistle went in the Watford Leeds game we were celebrating and then Abby came out of the toilet still crying and he's like why are you all celebrating and we were like Abby we've been promoted Leeds have won and he was like oh my god wow. this, yeah it was like it was like surreal because like when you look back on the whole thing like I think it was Amunia got injured in the warm-up then mm. they had a, their third choice goalkeeper was some young kid in the stand who'd been released I don't know how true this is, but this is what we were told. Hmm. He was in the stand after being released. He gets told he's going on the bench. Then the keeper who actually starts the game, the sub goalie, gets injured after 20 minutes. Then the young kid has to come on. And like he's just been released by the club. And then he's playing in one of the most important games like in their season. Um, and then like obviously he comes off his lane, he gets chipped. It was just like all surreal. But then even even the smallest thing, like um, I went on holiday straight away after because I had internationals. And um, I remember sitting in a bar watching like Leicester play Watford in the playoffs thinking, oh my God, I actually could be playing in the playoffs tonight. We'd 100% been knocked out. If we were Watford and we played Leicester, we'd have been knocked out straight. I know Palace went on to win it, but we'd have been knocked out of the playoffs. It was like that anti-climax really? of knocking out promoted Yeah. Like, like when we got promoted to the playoffs in 16, if you look back on it, with about five or six games to go, Steve Bruce started like changing the side an awful lot because we kind of like we were like, well, we're in the playoffs, we're kind of cemented there. Like, let's prepare for who are we going to get, which ended up being Derby. We were kind of preparing for that, even though I think it was was it Burnley and Middlesbrough also got promoted that year. I think Burnley won at Middlesbrough second. Mm. But if we had actually won some of the games leading in the playoff games, we could have been promoted one or two because Burnley and Borough mm. were kind of going all over the place. But like I remember, we lost the bolt in a way, was it or something? Um, he, like we we made some mad changes to the team, but he was obviously preparing for the playoffs. But wow. going back to the original one, it was just like I like it's 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 got to be one of the most dramatic endings to any kind of competition. Obviously, I wasn't involved involved, but like I was around when obviously City scored uh, the Aguero goal. I was at Sunderland at the time, and obviously we played United. So obviously they were all hanging around waiting. Of course. And the, yeah, and then like the messages came through the Sunderland fans, and they're all going like, "Ha ha ha!" Do you know? What I mean? just, you know yeah. But it, it was just, just weird. Surreal, wasn't it? I mean, you you summed it up perfectly. I think that a lot of fans listening in uh, will will <laughs> empathise with those feelings of anxiety. And uh, just one nuts. point I want to pick up on. It, yeah, crazy game, crazy crazy hmm. game. I want to. Just one question on that moment where you you weren't taking that penalty, and Nick, I think he blazed it over because it, it came. No, no, he went. He went. No, he went left. He went left. Well, the keeper saved. He went keeper left. Saved. And Marshy saved it. Yeah, Marshy saved it. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, obviously, went on to play for City, David Marshall. Yeah. 
what was going through your head after when Nicky Maynard put it in? Were you just thinking? Was it was it just like you couldn't quite believe it? Frustrated because you knew that you'd won the penalty. What, where where was your head at at that point? Basically, it was like bollocks. Like that's it. <laughs> like we're not getting, like that. That's like I remember because Fraser Campbell was meant to take the penalty. I don't know if you know that Fraser had already scored. But Fraser yes. was meant to take the penalty, and he said to me after. Um, I couldn't do it because he said inevitably I have the ball like he just said I couldn't take it and Nicky Maynard had a really bad injury and it was also there was a bit of like he wanted Nicky to score right um, to build up his confidence because he'd been out for a long time but he also didn't want to like bury me um, he said wow. that after he said I, I didn't feel comfortable taking the penalty I, th- I think I'd have killed Fraser after the game if he'd taken the score <laughs> I was still really good friends like but I think I think I'd have killed him <laughs> brilliant yeah. well yeah. the thing is the, the the rest as they say is history oh. we ended up getting promoted to the premier league in what is our second sort of appearance in in the place it was an amazing amazing achievement um and when we go into the premier league it's uh it's a it's a a league full of class acts players that are out of this world mm. and just take me through your sort of like Feelings going back to the Premier League. No, you were, you know, you were a comfortable starter in that team. You know, where was your head at when you first I tell you, went I tell you. position? I'll tell you that, Matt. Right. So obviously, when you look at any promoted side, I think it, I I know this first time from the Championship to the Premier League. They say on average, the team that gets promoted only five start. Mm. So out of say the group of players, like the club is going to sign that many players. And I remember thinking like, oh, this is great. We've been promoted. I'm going to play every week in the Premier League. This is going to be fantastic. And then we signed Jake Livermore and Tom Huddleston. And I thought, oh, oh. <laughs> like, and if you, if even if I look back, we played Chelsea in the opening game of the season. We were beating 2-0. Um, I think I played 65 minutes, something like that. Maybe you have 60 minutes. And Livermore and Huddleston came on. We were 2-0 down, but they played really well. I didn't get back on the team. I didn't get back on the team. I'm going to say for about, like, I think I missed five games then. I missed the next five games. Is that right? Yeah, but it was like, it was it was one of those. It was just kind of like, like we played Norwich at home in the next one. I remember Sagbo was sent off or headbutting someone. Um, yeah, like, that was the thing is, like, you kind of have all these expectations, like, of when you get promoted, obviously, in pre-season, you're excited. You know that the manager's going to sign players. Like, we signed Alan McGregor, uh, Curtis Davis, Tom Jake. I'd have to sit down and actually really think but like we ended up signing some like they were fantastic lads and very good players but it was like kind of like we've actually gone up a level or two and I remember like the first day Tom trained I thought oh my god how can I compete with that like technically mm. technically on the ball like he's probably the most naturally gifted footballer I've ever played with like the things wow. he could do with a football at his feet right or left foot it was effortless like the only thing I had on him was I could outrun him that was about the only thing I had. I was fitter than him. Um, but Tom was a genius. Yeah. But then Jake, Jake could run as much as I could, and he had like very good technical qualities. He wasn't mm. spraying the ball around like Tom. But like, even when you talk to top, like top internationals from Ireland or some of the lads I know from England, like they all go, "Whoa, Tommy Huddleston's passing!" Like there was a clip. Wow. I don't know if you saw it not so long ago. Um, is it the, the the young Argentinian boy Ganarcho? Um, at United Tom was playing obviously Tom's doing kind of a player slash coach role at the moment but he's zoned this 60 yard diag in the game and people are going oh my god this fella should be playing for the first team but that's Tom <laughs> like it was just it was so, like quality. I, that step oh, it, was, it was ridiculous it was ridiculous and it's, like, and it's think, quite go on sorry I think the first day we trained he chipped the keeper from like 30 yards um, and Brucey just blew the whistle and went oh that's training and we just oh, I, I I personally remember at that moment going, I'm I'm not playing for Hull anymore. Like, how can I compete with that? Wow. Like, he was just so gifted. It was frightening. Well, it's and it's and then you went on to to make well, what was in total 191 appearances, and you've produced mm. some of the most memorable moments in in City's history. I want to take you back to uh, the game against Liverpool. We we didn't win against Liverpool in 17 games, and we'd only played them 17 times. Um, it was a game at home. Uh, you were obviously playing in that game. And, of course, you scored what was, well, to make it 2-1, and I think it was a skirt loan goal, which Tom was desperate to have because he wanted to cut his oh, hair, I believe. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. 
yeah, the, the throw. But well, he didn't have to wait too much longer. Goal. No, because it was the Fulham game, wasn't it, where we yeah. won comfortably and he and he and he got his uh, barnet chopped off. But that goal, it, it clearly meant a lot to you. you, you, you I, 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 I hope you're not offended by saying that. I've never seen you run that hard and fast towards <laughs> towards the corner when you were celebrating. It was oh. a uh, it was brilliant. Just talk me through that that goal itself and what that meant to you. But like most people are, are aware at this point, like I grew up a Liverpool supporter. Like my idol growing up was Steven Gerrard as a player and Roy Keane. Obviously being from Cork, i kind of gravitated towards Roy. Um, two incredible midfielders. Um, but then like also at the time, Jordan Henderson was a really good friend of mine because obviously we'd spent a lot of time in Sunderland together and we were mm. close. He was playing for Liverpool. Like... It was just kind of one of those where you're playing, you're starting against the team you supported as a boy. You want to be successful. You want like you, you know, you want to beat them. People always say that we ever conflicted. I think I played Liverpool three times at home and we beat Liverpool three times. Um, mm. I need someone to check that. But we definitely so played we I played I played with Marco. Obviously, Brucey we beat them three one. I played with Marco, we beat them two 0 Remember, Niassi scored. Um it was a long ball down the top of the I played in that. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there was three games in a row at home we beat Liverpool um, which was like unreal people always say that to me but like going back to the goal if you look at it right if you look at the kind of the moment before I think it's Rose Senior fires the ball back it's like a free kick or a long and it comes back and Rose Senior but it's so scrappy like yeah just comes to you and then it it just falls to me and I touch it and like the thing is like I'm trying to generate so much power on it right I smash it cleanly. I catch it perfectly and it flies into the bottom corner. But I've hit it that hard and that well. I've actually fallen over. <laughs> it took a tumble, didn't you? Straight away. Yeah. But the thing was, I, I'd never seen it go in. Like, that was the thing. It was, right. it was the crow cheered. And I didn't know if I'd scored. That's the truth. I didn't know if I'd scored or not. I was like, kind of going, Hold, is that gone in? And I was like, is it mine? Or has like, you know, someone ran at the back post and tapped it in? And I remember Alex Bruce comes charging at me, like with his hands up, like trying to grab me. I remember just obviously then, as you said, like sprinting off to the corner flag. Like, but like it was my first Premier League goal against right. the team I'd grown up supporting, playing against one of my good friends and my idol. Do you know? Like it was like, it was all these things. All my family happened to be there. Like it was just surreal. And then obviously to go on and win 3 1. Obviously, I'd assisted Jake's goal as well. So I had a goal and assist in the game. I was like, this was. You're laughing. This was. Yeah, the, the inner child of me at like five or six, this is the stuff you dream about. Whether you're young boys and girls now kicking balls, whether you're shouting, you know, Beth Mead or Harry Kane, whatever it may be. That was me, like, you know, back at home. Like, I remember watching Steven Gerrard as a young kid play for Liverpool, thinking like, I want to be like him. You know what I mean? No, I never turned out Absolutely. like him. But that was the thing. And obviously Stevie scored a free kick in a game. I got Stevie's shirt after the game. It was like all my stars aligned that day. It was like Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it yeah. was certainly it was certainly a uh, one of the most memorable games I think that I, I've ever seen watching City, and of course meant so much to you, and you could see that. And what would go on to to start off a um, a, a good a good sort of set of, of results. You, and we did you know? Did you know we were on our Christmas party the week before? <laughs> no, most people when, most we, people don't know that. Play? Was it like was it like when was I thought it was like the eighth of December? I wanna, yeah, I no, I think I think it might oh. be the first of December. Was it the first? What were you doing? First, second, Christmas or third, or something November? like that. Yeah. No, but the whole thing was Brucey's big thing was because obviously the De- the December schedule is obviously it's it's carnage for footballers. Um, yes, and then obviously he knows that you're going to be going out. Like, so you usually play a game on a Saturday. You're 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 off till Monday lunchtime. That's kind of like what happens. So you end up going out Saturday night, and then you go out Sunday day. Um, you'll watch the football, you'll end up having, like, basically drinking all day, having a bit of crack, having a, like, a bit of team bonding. It's good fun. So yeah. we we went to Dublin, but we were sitting in Temple Bar. For anyone who's yeah. Irish knows, like, it's a lively spot or whatever, around the Christmas time. But he, like, Bruce, he had this thing where he didn't want it too close to Christmas because of other football teams going, um, like, say, the normal people going, that it, he said it would be too busy. So he always liked it done nice and early. So we were sitting in Temple Bar, and I just remember Paul McShane goes, Jesus Christ, lads. And everyone went, well, what's wrong, what's wrong? He said, we're playing Liverpool next week. <laughs> and everyone was just like, oh, oh well, we, ah, we, we might as well enjoy ourselves. We ain't beating Liverpool. That was like the laughing kind of joke, like we ain't beating Liverpool. Come back, we end up beating Liverpool, like you said, 3-1, right? So we're all in the change room after, after the game. 
and everyone's like hugging and like going, that's an unbelievable three points for us. Because, you know, like the objective of the start of the season is to stay in the Premier League. We're trying to get Absolutely. to that magic 40 point mark. But it was funny because Steve Bruce walked in the change room and he was like, yeah, like I might have been some explicit over. He was like, wow, like what a result. And Paul McShane sort of went, right, lads, everyone back to Dublin. Like <laughs> Bruce, he started laughing. He says, well, if you're going to perform like that every week, you can go back to Dublin every week. You know, it's like we never went back, like, but it was one of those. It was surreal to think like a week before we were sitting, I think we were in fancy dress. <laughs> in fancy you go dress and, Do you remember? Um, I went to the Joker. Go from Batman. Yeah, of course. You know, <laughs> well, that, that... Yeah, <laughs> a bit of yeah. a mucky night, but of course it led to it led to that three-one victory and and mm. many moments. I, I'm wondering if um, you may have been out the night before, maybe the, even the night after. When I bring up this next name, and his name is Mr. Alan Pardew. Now I know we talked earlier yeah. about a certain somebody. Um, and that incident, I won't, we don't need to dwell too much on it because I think if you're a Hull City fan, you know about the incident. I kind of want to get your take on it now. It's been around about eight years since it happened. Um, oh, it's eight and a half years. It. First, eight and a half first, years. Is it the 1st of March or the 1st of April? Something like that. So clearly it's, no. it's still etched in your memory. <laughs> well, how could I forget? Like it, it, it more or less put me on the map, that incident. Uh, <laughs> it was it was one of the craziest things that I've ever sort of like seen. I was just thinking like, did that actually just happen? Because I think when we looked when we looked at what was going on, we didn't actually a lot of us didn't actually see what was going on. It was like going on Twitter and stuff that we'd seen that it, yeah. that, that, that was why you know been sent sent off. I just thought, oh my god, this has happened. Have you have you encountered? Because I know that I saw an interview that you did, um, and it sort of said that you were at Palace and you kind of shook his hand, but didn't really acknowledge anything, didn't really apologise. It's been a few years on since. Have you have you seen him at all? Has there no. been any sort of no, not once? No, I've never, I've never no. Well, like what well, like at the end of the day, what like what do I want from him? I don't want anything. Like I said, like I felt kind of like he should have apologized. Yeah. But this is the thing that can be kind of misinterpreted. I don't want an apology for what happened. I want an apology for not coming after him and pressing charges and that. You know what I mean? That kind of like yeah. Like I put it to bed and I left it. Do you know what I mean? Like I had the police on the phone and everything seeing if wow. I wanted to press charges. I thought it was a wind up. And then the club secretary at the time at Hull had to ring me and say like, no, the police genuinely want to talk to you because it was classed as an assault in a uh, public location. That like, wow. But I was kind of like, no, like this is this a wind up? And it, uh, like, but three times it was like, like it was like say Sergeant Constable. And I was like, this has to be a wind up. Like, is this Robbie Brady or Snodgrass or something? Who's this on the phone? Like, it has to be a wind up. I kept hanging up. Oh, but it was just, yeah, it, it was one of those moments that what annoys me about it is Newcastle were pumping us 3 0. Mm. And we were like, we couldn't string four passes together. We we're just having an off day. And the ball obviously goes out. And I rush to get the ball. And then, like, he just, he puts his foot there to stop the ball. And then he moves his foot. And I, just, I say something like, you dickhead. Like that yeah. or something. Then he, ooh. And then it was just kind of, it was just a coming together. But the funniest part about it was his assistant was John Carver. Mm. And like, he came, he came running over after like, say it became a, a kind of like, you know, like a, a six or seven man scramble. Like yes. El Mohammedi, Elmo grabbed me or whatever, right? And like, if you look at it, I do actually clock my hand to punch like, and Elmo pulls me. If you do look at it back, you're ready. You're ready to give him a little, a little. Yeah, but like, no, I've gone, I've gone. Like my right hand comes back, and Elmo kind of pulls me and knocks me off balance. I end up shoving him with my left hand. Yeah, but like it's it's. So John Carver was the assistant, and he just starts kicking off. I hope he's like. I remember looking. I'm going to go. You'll get filled in too. Like it was like, it was one of those. It was a bit surreal because I had a moment. I had a moment of head loss, and then I kind of like you kind of calm down, thinking like. Shit, this is this is totally irrelevant to actually what what's what like you know like we're actually losing a game oh, here we ended up losing four one I think it was but like it was like kind of like it's, this is so relevant I need to focus on the game and I remember I think it was I don't know it was Steve Bruce or Steve Agnew said to John Carver after he said he will he will come fucking running into the changing room to find one of you after and he was like <laughs> seriously and he says yeah if he loses the head. I didn't. I, I had a split moment of rage, but I didn't lose it fully. I was going to say, and I'm, I'm bet you're glad you didn't, but it's certainly one of the memories. Got a question? A question? Uh, uh, what I, I believe is a tongue-in-cheek question from Rich. He says, 
what are you saying if you get the call saying Pardy wants a bit when it comes to YouTubers turning their hand to boxing? <laughs> if Pards gave you a call, David, what are you saying? I would kindly refuse. Just be, like man. Alan Pardy must be way on. Even if it was like a full on like boxing boxing match, right? Right. I mean, uh, he's born in sixty one, so Alan Pardy was sixty one. Right. Like I'm thirty three. I've got twenty eight years on him. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd like yeah, to. No, I'd like to think I, I would be fine. Imagine we did something for yeah, charity, think... though. Imagine, imagine a little spark, little oh, little five three minute this... rounds. This this could be the start, mate. <laughs> it's all no, and back special. No, 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 <laughs> not no, no, gonna no. happen, mate. No, not that gonna would be happen, mate. Three minutes. <laughs> well it was it was a moment um that a lot of people will remember and of course you went on to there's plenty of memorable moments and i want to get on to um the fa cup run and what that was i know that um in the quarter final i believe we played sunderland and you scored in yeah. in in that game as well and then of course the semi-final two a game that was it was out of this world five three in the end um but i want to take you to the final minutes of that game. I know you played your hand in the third goal. Tom Hull, you laid it off to Tom and he scored. And then, of course, it was um, a ball into Livermore. I slipped Jake in. I slipped, yeah, I slipped Jake in. Jake put it to Quinny to make it four. That was 4-2. Four, 4-2 two. Four, and, two, and then 4-3, yeah. of course. So it's 4-3. And, you know, you just thought you were defending for our lives. So what are you doing on the centre circle, getting ready to spring the counter attack to score your fifth goal? Uh, hold on, hold on. I, I believe, <laughs> I believe, I actually pass the ball to Maddie Freyard, who lays it off to Elmo. Now I yes. stand by this, and I swear by this. Right? If that had been any other player on the pitch, any other Hull player, it wouldn't have put me in Bar Elmo. Really? We could hear everyone. I well, I could hear everyone as I was running in the middle of the pitch. You think like there must have been eighty odd thousand at the game? I could hear mm. Brucey screaming, "Go to the corner." I could hear our players going, go to the corner. And I remember as I'm running, I go, Elmo, I'm in. And he just puts me in. Because I was like, yeah. I was there looking. I was like, because they had one player up high, they they had one dropped off. I was like, I'm not offside here. Like, I was like, Elmo just slipped me in. And he puts me, he puts me straight in. It's just like kind of, well, this is it. Like, we're four three up. You're one on one against the goalkeeper. And I was like, it's not too difficult to beat a goalkeeper. Like, I was, I was coming at an angle and I, ma I made it look like I was going to open up my body to go around him. And I just, like once I struck it, I was like, oh my God, it's gone in. And then here's here's one that most people don't know. So do you know when I ran to the corner? Obviously, then I do a little dance mm. with Elmo. That was that was that was me taking like making a joke of Elmo's dancing when we were promoted. Do you remember in front of the camera? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah that's, why, stage, that's why I did it. it. Yeah, I was I was laughing at him. That's why I said, Elmo, you're dancing, and the two of us are laughing at one another. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, it was, it was just it was... like unreal. And I mean, it was the sheer relief. I remember being in the gods at that game and I was with my sister and my old man. And obviously we were so nervous as fans um, mm. when we, when it went to 4-3. And, and then, of course, you score. And I can't describe the feeling, mate. It was just pure, just like relief and like, oh, it wasn't even like excited to get to the effort. It was like, oh, thank God we didn't blow it. It was just, it was amazing. And it must have been the same for you. I mean, it then set up uh. one of the... the, the one of the biggest games in, in Hull City's history, an FA Cup final against Arsenal. Um, you, of course, started that game. And um, those first 15 minutes will go down in history in, at this club um, with with the two goals. Just, uh, just take me through your... Club. your not just, that, that, will go down in, that will go down in FA Cup history. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. 100%. Because like, your thoughts I'd that argue with that. Like, yeah. Like, the big thing for us, right, was... We were all in the change room. Arsenal were in their change room. And then, like, obviously, you get the call. But we had gone through our tactics, the last few messages. I think Curtis said a few words. And we'd kind of gone through everything. And we were all in the tunnel. If you, ever, if you could get footage of it and look at it, we were all in the tunnel standing there. Like, boots are tight. Socks are done. Like, there's tape on the socks if you wear tape on your socks. Shirts are tucked in. Like, we are all standing there ready to go. Arsenal come out. Some players don't have their shirts on, their boots aren't tied, like their wow. socks are down, their pads aren't in. Like, I'm going to say that's probably why we had the start we had. They were a bit like, okay, they knew, like, I'm not going to say they, they disrespected us, but they were kind of like, all right, like, you know what I mean? 
we'll play in, in, in our own time, kind of like, you know, like we'll, I'll be ready when the time needs to be ready. They were, they were, they seemed very relaxed. But we were all like straight looking down the tunnel. Like there was no eye in left or right or whatever. Like I remember Santi Carzola standing alongside me with like his lace is undone. I was there thinking like, oh my God, like we, we just kind of got this gist that they weren't ready. And then we went, we just went boom, bosh, bang, wallop. And we were 2-0 up. Kurt and Chesney scored. Like, I still think if we get to halftime at 2-0, we win the game. I really do. Yeah, because um, it was the, it was a, it was a Santa Cazola free kick that made it 2-1, wasn't it? And it was almost like, I think us as fans, we were all, we were almost like, okay, there's that bit of quality. I mean, it was, what, 30 hmm. yards out and he, and he hit it, he hit it in. And did it, did do you have a lot of regrets from that game, particularly with, with us being 2 0 up and such a massive occasion? Or was it a sense of you'd got to this stage and you'd performed ever so well? Um, you know, wh- where's your kind of head at now looking back? Um, I, I'm not going to say we like we've all spoken about it kind of with one another and we don't have regrets. Like, and I, I look at it, I don't have regrets. We were simply beaten by a better team. And it was just kind of like, like their quality shone through when it needed to. Like, I'll never forget going into extra time. They brought on Wilshire, Rasicki and Sonogo. Okay, mm. Sonogo didn't have much of an impact. But I remember like thinking like, we were we were breathing heavy in midfield and they brought on Wilshire and Rasicki and just started like, like it was almost like, like it gave them a total new lease of life where they were just patting balls and we were running on empty like. And we did so well to contain him. I think Ramsey scored in the 117th or 18th minute. Like, we'd done so well to get that far. But even if we'd gone to penalties, like, don't get me wrong, there, there is a certain amount of luck involved in penalties that, like, like would our boys be capable of taking penalties? Like, we, like I think I clocked, like, 100 or um, 17K in that game. Wow. Like, which is, like, yeah, which is unheard of across 120 minutes. It's the first time and only time in my career I've ever gotten cramped. Um, really? Like we'd wow. given everything, yeah, we'd given everything to that game. And, like, like I think I think inevitably we just came up short. Like, I, yeah. I, I would never look at it. Obviously, I'm, I'm gutted, I'm heartbroken. I've never watched it back like that. We were so close to winning an FA Cup. You know, like, it was 60 minutes, 60 minutes away from winning it. Yeah, and it was. Oh. I mean, in terms of a from from that playing group, I, I can't describe the sort of that as a as a fan base how proud we were the boys. Like you know, it was it was it was our ache when we when we lost it in the end, and it was like, but you just knew that you know we couldn't have done anything more. Like you know, if if Sony puts his put that puts that ball in when the mm-hmm. keeper rushes out, or if you know, Ants made a, a comment here about Bruce's header that's ki- cleared off the line yeah, by yeah. Kieran Gibbs. You know, there's, there's there's always these things in football, but. Yeah, we couldn't have been prouder, but it certainly kind of like, you know, spurred us on. And of course, that led to the European Cup berth or playing in Europe. I mean, it was it was short lived, but to 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 have whole city in the same sentence as European football was, oh no. Oh no. was bonkers, mate. What was that like for you? Never mind whole city. It was like some of us were playing in the Europa League. Like it was just weird. Yes, I think I think the Europa League became a distraction for us, even though we only played four games. But it was like, mm. we ended up signing a lot of players. And then it was hard to, like, I imagine it was hard for the manager to keep that many players happy because we kind of expected, uh, what do we play? Lochran. We beat Trench and then we played Lochran. Um, and obviously we lost on away goals. But it was kind of like, we'd signed a lot of players thinking like, well, we need a bigger squad. And it kind of like, it was like just the whole thing of like, we obviously had to do the qualifying rounds. So we, we ended up having an earlier preseason. And then like it just it kind of the Premier League just kind of went a bit hair shaped. Like, right. And then obviously, yeah, it didn't, it didn't. And inevitably we were relegated from it. Like, but it was Yeah, it was it was a it was a season where, you know, you, you when we look back now, you think to yourself, Oh wow, it was European football. Of course, you say there it, it affected the full season. Like you, you know, a, a lot mm. of teams will look at those first few games and think to themselves, Oh, it's just the first few games we'll win it back. But I think, you know, for us it was like, you know, we're gonna scrape every point. So it's it's interesting to to hear that there was actually a more of a distraction. Um Yeah, like that's it, that's almost how it felt because like if we'd gotten to the group stages, then there would have been a different dynamic. A certain thing because 
you know, we would have had more games. And if you could have won one of your group games, then the confidence you could take back into the league. We almost started the season on like a massive donor of like getting beaten on away goals because we were gutted. Like I think Tom missed a penalty. Tom won't clear it off the line. There was all sorts kind of going on. And like, it was just kind of like, it, it almost, like the air was left out of the balloon. Yeah, no, totally. And it's and it's it's, it's one of them ones where, as you say, you, you when you look back, you, you can't quite believe it. But of course, it made such a, an impact. And uh, I think the, I was going to come on to this, but I think it's appropriate to say it now, it's sort of like, your your regrets at, at, at City um, in your career. Um, you've obviously you obviously achieved so much with with what you did and um, and the games you played and the goals you scored. But is that one of the sort of the, the bigger regrets not getting to the group stages, or can you think of another one like maybe the relegations? And what was your kind of like top regret when you played for City? Hmm. Um. I suppose the biggest one, even though it wouldn't be, was not winning the FA Cup. Mm. Um, that would be the biggest one. Like the Europa League, like we were never going to win it. <laughs> like that's just fact. Like, you know what I mean? Like once the yeah. Champions League teams even come down, if we went on this mazy run, like we were never going to win it. So the Europa League group stage, of course, would have been lovely to experience that with Hull. And, you know, if we got pulled a big team, an Italian or Spanish or French team or German team, or whatever, that could be incredible to bring them to like Hull or go there and visit and play. That would have been special, of course, but it's not like an ultimate regret. The relegations, I think the first relegation, the first relegation was worse than the second relegation um, mm. because I felt we had a great core and Bruce, Steve Bruce did really well to keep that group, that core of players together when we were in the championship. Like we, we managed to keep on. But like, so I I would I would tend to say like kind of the FA Cup relegation, first relegation, second one, like the photo still obviously it's notorious with Hull fans, like that photo of us in Austria in the mountains, like there's only like nine of us there, like and it's like well, we're playing Leicester in a few weeks in the opening game of the season. Like, is anybody coming to save us? Like, well like that yeah. that was a bit like that was kind of that was heartbreaking as well because we started so well. Like obviously we played Leicester, beat Leicester, uh beat Swansea, lost to United drew with Burnley so like we'd seven points in the first four games but then we went and I think we played Bournemouth away and we were beaten six nil and then it was like yeah. five nil against Arsenal and it was just like kind of that was kind of the like I think it was eight or nine games in a row we lost and then obviously Mick Feely unfortunately lost his job but Marco Silva came in and you felt like there was really good work going under a Marco that could we potentially stay up here and um, it wasn't to be like but like that kind of like the, there's it's hard to say I regret anything, but there's definitely things I look back on and I think like oh I wish we had done a little a little few things differently there. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I, I want to just quickly touch on on that return back to the Premier League. Obviously, the disappointment you mentioned there about the first relegation, of course, um, the, the playoff final where a certain somebody just fancied it in one from. 25 yards out and just up and to, to curl and the rest where, where, where 30 we yards out we, we were all looking at going more what yeah. are you doing shooting from there <laughs> it was it was like, brilliant was... People... here's one for you right a lot of people don't know this right so I didn't start the game right um, I missed the derby games I came I played in the second derby game um, but I was injured I I like I pulled my hamstring so I was like struggling to get back Um and I, like, I, I ended up getting some minutes in the second derby game um, at home uh, when we lost. We beat them 3 0 down there, 2 0 at home. We lost 2 0. So I ended up playing in that. So I got some minutes. So then, like, I was kind of 50 50. And I played a lot of the games throughout the season. So I thought, like, oh, I might have a chance of playing here. Yeah. Um, obviously, then the lads, had, the lads in the first leg against Derby had done extremely well. But after 20 minutes in the game, if you, wa if you watch it back, right, Diami is having an awful game. Mo's all in over the final. place. Yeah, in the mm. final. And Bruce, told me to get warmed up. He said, you're coming on. So wow. he wanted to change it. And then he said, right. And then like Mo, I think Mo hit like this nice pass out the wing or something like that, right? And then he said, all right, we'll just give it another 10 minutes. That's a half time. So half time, he, he said a few pieces. And then he said to me like, right, be ready. And he, he told me about six times to get warm, be ready, you're coming on. And then, oh, and behold, Mo got the ball and he's stuck in the stanchion from... 30 yards, but we were all looking good. Don't shoot from there, Mo. 
because he had a habit of doing it in training where he would just shoot from mad things and then he just he just went in and we were like, oh my god. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, it was just I mean, it was the, just like mad. It was it was one of the uh, if you talk you talk about goals and amazing I mean Dean Windass scoring in, in the playoff final, a similar screamer, and then of course Mo pops up and I was right behind that with with my dad, and I just remember it going in, and I've never like just like that. I've never experienced that feeling at a football match when that boy at the back of that because um, because Westwood was absolutely unbelievable in the game, mm. wasn't he? That Wednesday goalkeeper, he was saving everything. I remember uh, Abel had a chance um, in the first half. I don't know how he got his hand to it, and then I think we uh, Dorset the post, and then it was just that goal. It, it was going to take something like that to win that game. It felt and uh, to score it was was amazing. And of course, um, it led to another stint in the Premier League. And you mentioned about those nine players. I remember that photo very well. I'm sure a lot of people listening in will remember that photo of the nine of you. Just where was your head at as a player there? Because you obviously want to play football, but you've actually not got enough players to, <laughs> to fill a team. Never mind have subs, and you run about quite a bit, mate. So you're not going to get. What, I mean, what the hell was going on there? Were you told it anything? Just... <clears throat> no, we weren't told a lot. But we knew we we knew things weren't right because like what manager gets the side promoted and then walks away, yeah. you know, like that's when we were all kind of that's when it kind of like mm, well that doesn't really make sense. The hardest thing where players started to leave, you know, and, and like like yeah. after after relegations and that, and that became that became so frustrating for me it was kind of like the amount of players I'd seen come and go, and it was just kind of like. I'm still here, like, and like it was just lads, like <laughs> yeah. lads, lads. I loved and loved sharing a change room with, loved playing with, with great characters, big personalities. They were just coming and going all the time, and it became it yeah, became it a bit too much. And it, that was, yeah, and that was the hard thing is like we kind of went into that season. You get promoted, and you you think right, this is great, like, but you're just losing players, and obviously, the photo, the photos in the mountains, and we're kind of like, like the funny thing was. <laughs> There's always like there's always a bigger story to these things. Like what mm. we were that was during the day. So uh we had the morning off and we were training that evening. So obviously there was nine senior, ten senior players, and we had about ten under 23s or under 18s with us. Um so we'd gone up the mountains and um lads, somebody said, Oh, should we have a pint? Because we knew that we'd light training later, wouldn't it? And we, we ended up having like, I'm gonna say like six or seven pints each. And we took the photo. <laughs> We went to training, um, went to training, but we, our big thing was, well, it's only us. So if, if, if all of us are drinking, like the manager can't say, the manager was Mick Feeling at the time. Well, I, he wasn't technically permanent manager. Um, he hadn't been given the job. Yet, we were like, well, well, we were saying like, well, what can he say to us? Like, it's all of us here. Like, it's kind of like, one, if it was one or two, okay. But it was like all the senior players. So we ended up going down to training. We had our boots, like we had about six, seven points in us. And he was just like looking at us going, something's not right here. Um, yeah, and then ho and behold, he made us run. We had to do what was it? I think we did eight box to box runs. So we had he had the 10 senior players on the left hand side of the box, right? So say the channel between the width of the box and the sideline. And he had the under 18s, under 23s on the right hand side of the box, uh, to the sideline. And we beat them in every run. Wow. And like, yeah, and it was like, <laughs> and he was like. Good. And he was like, and you lot, you lot have been out drinking or whatever. So he watched a call. He said, right, all of you back, back home. Um, and he made them do an extra six runs because he said, this I mean, lot have been out drinking all day and they're beating all of you. Uh, oh, good <laughs> That's times. fantastic. Good time. Honestly, mate, it, I'm not surprised you needed a few pints down here with that situation, to be honest. I mean, the fact that you can do that is, is, is incredible. It says a lot about you boys as, as a group. But yeah, the fact that, <laughs> the fact that you were stuck with the nine might have been, of you. I, I think it might have been. I think it might have been Snodgrass. I think it was Snodgrass. Was he the one who initiated it? I think he. I think he. He was the one, and he knew I'd jump on board straight away. I was like, "Ah, oh, I'll have a point with you. It's not going to make a difference to me. One point." Well, there we go. And then everyone it, was like, "Well, we'll all have one." It, it, it was a. It was a strange old time. That that season was very strange from top to bottom. It's as a fan, it felt it felt very strange, and then of course. Um, unfortunately getting relegated and a few difficult results towards the end of the season and mm. it eventually sort of led to that championship and of course you then um, left City on that, I believe it was the end of your contract and 
I know that at the time, I remember Nigel Adkins said in quite a few interviews, he was like, oh, you know, I really want to keep David on and I want and want him to play. Like, where where was your head at? Did you did you know your City time was up? Did you want to stay? Like, where, where was your head at? You know, like, I look back on it. I look back on that time and there was one part, right? So for anyone who wasn't aware, right, in all of our contracts, well, not everyone's, but the majority of us had clauses, right? So the club could extend your contract by a year. Right. But they had to let you know on the 1st of March. You had to be told by the 1st of March. It was obviously so you right. could get your affairs in order and whatever if you weren't. So I knew that I was coming to the end of my contract. Now I had this clause that hadn't, like, the club could trigger an extension for another year. So I hadn't heard anything, blah, 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 blah. It was actually the press officer one morning came in and said, Oh, I'm sorry to hear the club aren't renewing your contract. And I went, wow. What? And it was just kind of like, it, it was when he said it to me, I kind of went like, that was kind of the point where I said, is my time here done? Mm. Like, I, I I don't know what it was. I think it's something like 70 or 80 players I have played with that have left before me, which is wow. like unheard of from 2012 to 18. It was kind of like, like, it was a bit, it was a bit like, wow, is this like, and I suppose there was a part of me thinking, well, I had achieved great success and I'd been part of, obviously something was far, far larger than me, but I kind of wanted to just have a conversation with someone to say like, right, this is the way the club is going. This is what we're doing. You're in our plans or you're not in our plans. Thank you for everything. Kind of that's what, and I just kind of went, maybe, maybe, maybe my time is up. Um, and then I made a decision. I made a decision to go. Like it had nothing to do with the money or anything like that. It was kind of like, did me and my family want a new challenge? Like I've spoken about this somewhere else. My wife had three miscarriages in between my two kids. And it was also like an opportunity for us to have a fresh challenge. And there was kind of all these kind of things happening. Now, do I look back on it and think, should I have stayed? Like, I don't like, it's, 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 it's a hard one to look at, you know, like, because inevitably I went to Reading and that was just a shit show that didn't work out at all. So like, but it was also a great learning for me in, in terms of like, like I, I learned a different side of myself and what I had to deal with down there. Uh, so then I kind of look back and like, I could have gone and play with Nigel, obviously eventually we're were relegated and then Grant took over. Like who knows? I could have prolonged my career because everyone in the room, the physio room, the doctors, physios, whatever, were, were more or less there a long time with me. So they knew my body. Obviously, it's very different when you go to different physios and whatever, and they have different ways of doing things. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. But it's one of them I kind of look back on it and think, like, was there part of me that wanted to stay? Or was there part of me that wanted a new challenge? Or was part of me that said, look, I've done all I can here. This is kind of only going one way. And, like, look, Nigel, Nigel, I was actually chatting him to him, chatting to Nigel Atkins last night. And, there was part of him I know that wanted me to stay because he wanted me in around the place um, and he wanted me to obviously feature. I knew I wasn't going to play, yeah. you know, 46 games a season. I knew that, but like, I know there was, there was a part of me that was still wanted a new challenge. I don't know, but it is what it is. Yeah. And I think that, you know, talk about your, your legacy, your legacy rather at City it was uh it was already rubber stamp right I mean in terms of what you'd achieved and you know it all it almost felt like it was it was a rebuilding process and you know you'd already mm. gone through so much in your City career like I say had they experienced it the, the, the season prior with the nine player ten players and the drama that surrounded it. it it it's it feels to me that you were kind of disappointed with the way that the club kind of just it was a bit blasé considering what you'd done if that makes sense, in terms of when you'd when you'd left and it was the press officer that came in and said about mm. the contract renewal, it, it feels like, and I think you, you're totally right in, in that you you know deserved more. Did you did you just feel like that you know there wasn't there wasn't the respect you deserved potentially from the club? No, I won't say that because that that's how I felt at that time. Like mm. after, then I said, well, the club owe me nothing. Like the club were really good to me, and you know, I mean, I'd like to think I paid that back like in terms of my performances what i was able to achieve with the group of players i played with i look at it now and think well well that's the footballing world it's kind of a it is a business and i understand that at the time you kind of want to have a, a sit down conversation with someone and see what's what but then 
who am I to get that conversation regardless of what I achieved? Because you look at, now you see so many different scenarios where, you know, Sky produce the retain lists of players and lads are finding out through Sky Sports that, you know, and that's kind of the way it is. Um, I, I, I like, I, when I speak about that, I kind of look at that's where I was at at that moment. Now I look at it and kind of go, well, fair enough. But I was also used to, right, like, the interesting thing was, when I signed for Hull, Hull were obviously a team on the rise. Obviously, we got promoted. But Steve Bruce was manager from, like, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And then, obviously, Steve left. So I was used to having this, like, stable, stable management in place. Obviously, I know how the relationship turned with the owners, and I, I get that. I, look, I was part of that, like, in that time. Yeah. But, like, I was also part of when that was very successful, when, you know, we had 20-plus thousand at games where there was this incredible atmosphere. And I know people got upset with, with, with what Assam did uh, or tried to do with changing the name and different things, and I understand all that. But then it, it, it suddenly became frantic where, like, we went from, like, I had Steve Bruce for four and a half years, and then it was Mick Phelan, and then it was Marco, then it was Lena Slutsky, then it was Nigel Atkins. Like, there was just this constant changing then, and it was, oh, like, change. kind of, like, different players were coming and going. I was just, like, like there was a game we played. Uh, we played Derby in a game. I met two of the players in the tunnel for the first time before we played Derby in the championship. Really? I was like, kind of going, well, this isn't what I'm used to. Um, and a lot had changed over time. Um, well, look, it almost it almost football. feels as though, yeah, it almost feels as though you know, he, he, from the sort of the physical things that were there for you in terms of those constant changes, it was almost mm. like, well, if everything else is changing, it feels like, well, why don't I consider a change? You know. Um, mm. But I think somebody said certain... to me, somebody said to me, switch the lights off on the way out. Like I, I kind of like since I'd signed, every player had kind of left. Yeah. You're right. right. Um, everyone had left. Staff had left. Like in terms of, I'm well. I, when I say staff, no, I don't mean like the manager and the coaching staff. I mean like physios, doctors. They had all moved on. It was like mm. kind of like I was the last. Like well, I think there's one physio still there that was there when I was when I first signed. He's still there. Wow. Peachy, if you're watching, good guy, Peachy. But Peachy's like the last of a dying breed. He's wow. the, he's the well, last he's one from. Peachy. See, it seems like a good bloke, and it, and it sort of, you know, you look at you look back at your whole your whole city career, and like I say, 191 appearances, all these all these sort of like magical moments. I'll I'll call them in 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 city folklore. Really, it's uh, it was a it was a um, amazing stint at the club, and uh, yeah, certainly ran about a bit, mate, and um, and made us all uh, made us all dream again. Um, and then of course you 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 retired. You you said they had disappointing spell. At Reading, and you felt your your career was gonna um, was gonna come to an end, and you made that decision. And I want to talk about a couple of bits before. I, to be fair, I said to you, I would be doing this for half an hour tops, and we're fifty three minutes in, mate. So sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry for taking up your time. Sorry, but I just want to, I just want to mention about what you're up to now. So um, we've chatted a bit about your work with the um, the island, the under seventeens, and you've got the the DM seven academy. Do you just want to talk us through what? What you're up to now and uh, and how life is life is certainly a lot different um mm. the adjustment from playing professional football to retired life is a lot different obviously i'm i'm still only 33 i've retired young i um, i was forced to, with the knee injuries i suffered throughout my career but it's like kind of like well you've only lived a portion of your life um it's like what's your next buzz and it, it's it it can be a struggle. It can be because nothing, nothing can compare to scoring in front of 90,000 at Wembley, send your team yeah. through to an FA Cup final. Nothing can reach that peak. Like, obviously, I'm involved with the Ireland under-17s. That's a great buzz and it's a great relief to get back involved in football and to be able to help these young players develop. Obviously, ideally, we want to see them go on and play for top clubs and obviously play for Ireland. That's the kind of big objective but we want to be successful and we want to be competitive and we want to try and win um so that's something i enjoy like we're we're in the league phase of the european championship um in march we qualify from that we go to the euros competition which will be in the summer that's obviously a big aim of ours obviously like you said there i've got my academy which is going really well um obviously that's 
Bishop Burton on a Friday night for anyone who's children ages four to 14. Um, we've got some very good coaches. Um, I do little bits here and there. We probably will start to get a bit more hands-on come next year. We've got excellent coaches who run that. We currently have about 80 kids coming every week. That's great. Obviously, unless, unless anyone's ill, because there seems to be flu bugs going around all the time. Um, but no, that's going really well. That's really successful. So that's like kind of your Friday night's taking over. Um, obviously, my wife is kind of running the admin side of it, taking bookings, getting people down, making sure people know what's what and, and which child goes in which group and whatever. My own two kids are in it. And then the objective of that is, can we help some young boy or girl play for, you know, the whole city men or the whole city ladies first team? Can we help them, you know, carve out a career? Can we help them on their pathway to becoming professional footballers? Um, that's the aim of that. Something that I would love to see happen. If we could give anyone some small little help um, and they go on and have a career, that would be incredible. Um, so I've got that. And then, as you know, I do bits and pieces of media work, say, with Sky uh, back in Ireland. I do some radio work talking about football, talking nonsense about football. Um, not everyone always agrees with my opinions, but that's fine. That's, that's football, isn't it? Some people think Messi. Some people think Ronaldo. Anyone who thinks Ronaldo's think? wrong, oh, Messi all day, every day. <laughs> Messi Brilliant. all day, every day. It's not even. It's not even a debate. Like Ronaldo's an incredible athlete. This is the thing: is some people love Messi and hate Ronaldo. I admire them both, but Messi edges it for me. Well, it sounds like what you've done post career is is looking for that next David Myler in in the academy and we wish you all the success for that part of a ladies team and maybe we'll see one of the players from that academy emerge into the uh into Hull City first team we'll be cheering as we did for you when you were playing for us mate uh fingers crossed um, I'll be in the stand I'll be in the stand going I helped him <laughs> that's I, helped me. Him. Yeah. I did that yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you what we'll do I've got a few quick fire questions you can take these as uh, as quick as you want um, to finish off, it's been a really great episode. Thanks so much for your time. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, what kind of questions are these now? Am I going to be like, what am, what am I getting? No here? daft. No, no daft. Okay. All Hull City related. So it's not been like, is it about glam, me mate. or it's... my time at Hull? Is it about me or my time at Hull? Or how does it work? Or how we just, well, I don't need to know the exact thing, but like, it's about your time at Hull and okay. a couple of, a couple of, Cheeky ones in there. So we'll start okay, with okay. Uh, first question. Your favourite Hull City moment? Uh, FA Cup semi-final. Good man. Favourite Hull City goal? Liverpool. Manager you've played under, I believe. I know the answer to this one. The managers I played under? At City, what yeah. You said? Um, Steve Bruce, Mick Phelan. Um, then Mick left, Marco took over, then we'd lean it, then we'd Nigel. So that's five. Who's your favorite one? Steve Bruce. Steve Bruce. I have to pick Bruce. Uh, I had him for four and a half years or four and a half seasons. Best friend at the club. Ooh. Mm, I couldn't give you one. Um, I got on really well, like like going back to the initial days of the championship. I know you said quick fire now, but like uh James Chester used to have a house on a Friday night, like um, James obviously had Paul McShane living with Robbie Brady but we, I used to go around there for dinner uh, Cordy Evans used to come Joe Dodge and Stephen Quinn we'd all have dinner together on a Friday night then when you move forward Jake, Tom, Kurt, Greg Z like they all came got on really well with all them so I, I, I no I couldn't I couldn't pick one it feels mm -hmm. like a, a top group anyway um, yeah. I'd say what as a, um, a comment come in saying, I played in goal against Miley's team at five aside a year and a half ago. He still got it. Well, there we go. Uh, <laughs> from, uh, from I, nearly, I, I nearly butchered my knee in that again. I did. I haven't gone back. <laughs> I hurt my knee in that. Uh, no, Not what you on. need. Um, no. Best City player you've played with? Most gifted... Technically gifted was Tom. Hmm. So. Give you Tom. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go Tom. What, what about the, the best um, player you've played against whilst playing for City? Wow. Well, David Silva. I remember yeah. that game. 
I think it's another one you're on about. The first half an hour, I've never seen not like it. Um, who was the best at training? Stephen Quinn. Quinny. Great play. I think he's at Mansfield now, I think, Quinny. No, he's still going yeah. strong, him, Quinny. He doesn't, he, but he don't train no more. He just plays games. He was telling me <laughs> he's knees buckled as well. Quinny, <laughs> really? Quinny was... Quinny was unbelievably so underrated. I think Hull fans eventually like really appreciated how good he was when he left. Um, Quinny was excellent. excellent. Yeah, it was top. Um, your least favourite Hull City moment? Relegation. Um, like the Marco one, obviously, when we lost the Spurs. Um, who did we play in the other one? Do you remember when the we lost Palace. the Burnley 1-0? No, we lost to Burnley at home 1-0. Danny, Danny Ings scored for Burnley. That game was kind of like about 4-5 or five to go, I think it was. And that, that was the moment we kind of said, shit, we feel like we're going we're gonna to be relegated here. It was kind of like, really? if we won that game, um, yeah, the relegations are the worst moments. 100%. Uh, two more. Uh, would you go for a pint with Pards if he asked you? Yes. Good. As long as he's paying... And <laughs> he best be and yeah. uh, my final question um, uh, is will Hull City be in the Premier League in the next three years what do you think Under Liam three Rossini. years three years three yeah um... no no two years it's because... <laughs> <laughs> what a way to finish yeah. I think oh, I think brilliant. I think Rosie Rosie just needs um, two transfer windows kind of like you'll get January in the summer a couple of players I think this year should be about stabilising in the championship looking at the top half of the championship mm. a couple of adding a couple of key players in areas where he wants to obviously they're probably crying out for an Abel Hernandez type who's going to get you 20 plus goals a year um, and I think stabilise then next season you can do that and add key players, then push on looking at playoffs. So two or three years, I hope so. I think so. I think Rosie can do it. I hope he does it, man. He's a great fella. He's a great guy. I really hope he does it. Especially if you get the call up to be part of his coaching staff, but we won't go there, mate. <laughs> that was that was trending on Twitter there for a while, lad. It was, yeah. I think I, quite a few of oh, us were like, yeah, oh, it'd be great oh. in there. Oh. No, but look, it, it actually got to the point. Here's one for you, right? It got to the point where people, friends of mine that I've made through, like I still live in Hull, friends I've made, say, outside of the football and world who support Hull and whatever, they were ringing me going, hey, man, what's this? You you back with Rosie? Yeah, and I was like, no, I'm not, pal. I'm not back. I'm not going, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? There's been no conversation between me and Liam or whatever. And I said, like, even if Liam had rang me, obviously it would, mm. it would be an opportunity too good to turn down. Right, and I, I, I know that, but I wouldn't feel I'd be able to do him justice yet because I'm still learning like the process of coaching and managing. And if I was to go in, I want to feel like I'm ready. Now, I've also been told you'll never be truly ready until you're thrown in at the deep end, and you kind of have to then trust your knowledge. And you know, what I mean, you have got to do extra work, and you got to be prepared, and you got to. I just felt like even if I got asked, I wouldn't be ready for what he'd need at that time. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Don't get me wrong, in 12 months, like in the summer, Rosie, I'm available. Get me in. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Well, Dave, we'll, we'll end on that. And Rosie, if, you, if, if you're listening, pick up the phone, mate. It's been, a, it's been an amazing yeah. episode. Thanks so much for your time, Dave. We've talked all hey, things man, City. Man. And um, I really appreciate your time. And all the best with, with everything going forward, of course. You talk about the coaching, the academy, and everything you're working on, mate. Um, obviously a pleasure watching you at City and uh, yeah get back on them comms because whenever you're on you seem to make sense mate so if you're on the oh, whole do you, City, hear, uh... do you know the funny do you know the funny here quick now I'll finish on this little one so I didn't know obviously right um, I was speaking to the club during COVID mm. and I was there kind of going can I come to a game I was there thinking I'll come on my own I go to a lot of games on my own or I might bring my son and my, my daughter likes to go yeah. the wife every now and then wants to go just to kind of relive years ago um mm. but i was like i was pestering the club and everyone kind of gone i really want to go i really want to go and they were like kind of go man we can't let you in just because of covid protocol um it's efl protocol yeah. only certain amount of people left and i was like then we got brainstorming somebody said well if you do co-commentary you can come so i was like yeah no hassle i'll come right and i was like brilliant 
So as you said, I got on cold commentary. No. I didn't know this was being streamed as a neutral game. <laughs> I thought it was I thought it was dedicated just to Hull fans. So I mm. thought it was kind of like Hull City live link. Like you got Fletch and Myler on comms, and it's just for you. Now, if somebody else wanted to watch it, you kind of knew it was going to be predominantly Hull based. Yeah. Right. But I was doing the commentary. I think I think Hull played Wigan. I think it was Wigan or something. One of their players was going down the wing and he crossed the ball in and like crosses a bit in front of the player and he dived at it and he got a touch and went wide. And I remember Fletch obviously was on commentary. Um and he was giving all the oh like it's a great attacking player, he's whipped it. And I've gone, nah, nah, nah. It's, nah, it's not even a good <laughs> ball. Like I said, he's nowhere near, it's never gonna be a goal. And everyone, but I got absolutely abused after it because I was really? meant to be an impartial commentator. I didn't know that it was, I thought it was just the whole fans. I was going, nah, don't worry about it. You know, he's never getting to it. <laughs> but it was funny because I was getting pelters after, and we had a laugh and joke about it after with the, the bosses at Hull. But it was funny because I was there kind of going, oh my God, I've just like, you know. <laughs> well, don't, it, lose it. Fire, oh, don't lose that fire, mate. Don't lose that fire. It's always it's always great to hear from you, mate. And I'm sure our, our paths will, will cross soon enough. But as I say, mate, great to have you on. Uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, look forward to seeing what we get up to in the future, mate. And uh, for all those who've been listening in and, and watching, thanks for joining us. Uh, this has been the To Hull and Back podcast. We'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Go on. Hop the Tigers. Hop the Tigers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, top man, pal. See you later.